I know, I know, another Mechanics Mondays Tuesday edition. Frankly, there are a lot worse things I could have done, so let's just move on, shall we? Damage per round or DPR is a metric often used and relied on by most of us who are into figuring out the best damage dealing character concept. But is it actually reliable? Does it even matter? In this video I will talk about reasons why you should and should not focus on it. Before we delve deeper into the numbers, please be as accurate and deal as much damage as possible to the engagement buttons down below. YouTube algorithm has hundreds, thousands of hit points and any damage you do to it is much needed and much appreciated. When assessing the damage dealing potential of any D&D character, the usual method involves calculating averages based on the median damage dice values multiplied by hit probabilities. For example, a level 5 fighter with 16 dexterity and archery fighting style has a plus 8 bonus to hit and on average deals 7.5 damage per hit with a longbow. With extra attack feature, this archer shoots 2 arrows so we basically doubled its damage up to 15. However, against an armor class of say 15, this fighter has to roll 7 or above on the d20. This means that 14 out of 20 potential outcomes of the d20 roll will result in a hit. In other words, the chance to hit is 70%, so if 70% of the attacks hit, that means that this fighter deals deals only 70% of its average damage as well. This finally brings us to 10.5 which is the DPR of this fighter. Some people like to take this a few steps further and include advantage and disadvantage, feats like sharpshooter and great weapon master, critical hit chances and multiple armor class values to calculate the average damage output against. This quickly bubbles into massive spreadsheets with dozens of rows and columns and hundreds of numbers. Those of you who watched one or more of my career character build videos on this channel will know I tend not to focus on these stats too much. I do provide some kind of damage breakdown in most of my character builds but I usually do not put too much weight on them. They do matter a lot of course. They also do make for good clickbait in the YouTube thumbnails as well, evident by tens of thousands of views on some of this channel's videos. Thank you for that by the way, I really do mean it. However, if you've played D&D just once in your life, you will know that these stats immediately go out of the window as soon as initiative gets rolled and you start throwing your attack and damage rolls. On any given day, you may just end up being very lucky and all of your attacks hit and deal massive damage. Or if you're like me and the dice are your mortal enemies, you will be missing on most of your attacks and even when you do hit, your damage rolls will suck. This boils down to the simple fact that any and every isolated specific singular D&D combat encounter is statistically insignificant. This is most evident in the attack rolls or any d20 roll for that matter. Think about it. Your typical combat encounter rarely lasts more than 5 rounds. It often doesn't go more than 2. But let's assume it drags for a while. During those 5 rounds, even a level 20 fighter with its super mega extra attack would only roll 28 attack rolls, maybe 30 if it gets a couple of opportunity attacks. Maybe 35 with certain feats, but that's about it. It doesn't really go that much higher. Now, that does seem like a lot of attacks, and it is, but that number needs to be in the hundreds instead of the dozens to be truly statistically significant. This is why when I make damage focused character build videos, I tend to avoid including hit chances specifically, or accuracy as some people like to call it in the damage calculations. There's simply no way for anyone to know how many of your say 10 attacks against a horde of raging minotaurs will actually hit. On paper your attacks may have 60 or 70 percent chance to hit, so you may assume that out of those 10 attacks 6 or 7 will hit, but it could be that only 3 will hit, or maybe 9 will and 2 of those 9 will be critical hits. Both of those are very much possible. There's just no way to know this because as I've said the number of attack rolls in any individual combat encounter is not statistically significant. That's why you always see so much variance in your actual battle performance at the table. The randomness of d20 and all the damage dice is too big of a factor to be ignored. Most often you will be hovering in the relative proximity to the average outcomes, but there will be extreme outliers more often than most people even expect. 
I mean, I've seen a 10 damage fireball and I've also seen a 46 damage fireball. 28 is the average by the way. But going even beyond the randomness of d20 alone or even the damage dice, DPR calculations are based on frankly incomplete, insufficient, maybe even unrealistic assumptions. This table found in chapter 9 on page 274 of Dungeon Master's Guide or similar tables to this one from say Xanatar and other source books, I'm seeing them all the time in other people's character concepts and character guides. They are used as official sources to base your calculations on, but I've personally never understood why people put so much emphasis and focus on them. Sure, you need to make some kind of assumption, you need to make some kind of guess about a theoretical monster's stats, but you may as well come up with any number because these fixed guidelines do not translate well into practice at all. Let's take a look at challenge rating 5 elementals as an example. Air elementals armor class is 15, so that does fit the table perfectly, but its hit points are only 90, way below the suggested minimum of 131. However, it has resistance to non-magical attacks, so if a aforementioned fighter is shooting non-magic arrows, it's only dealing half the damage. So the theoretical DPR of 10.5 is basically then cut down to 5.25. Fire elemental however only has a 13 armor class, so the chance to hit grows to 80%, not 70 like we initially calculated it to be. This raises the effective theoretical DPR up to 6 because it is also resistant to non-magical attacks. But then we get to earth elemental with its AC of 17 knocking down the hit chance to just 60% and an effective theoretical DPR down to 4.5. It can also choose to just burrow into the ground if it wants to, so that basically makes you deal zero damage to it, you can't even avoid that, right? This discrepancy is made even more extreme when you consider that Black Pudding, which is also a challenge rating 5 monster, has an armor class of just 7 and is not resistant to non-magic piercing damage. However, it's immune to any form of slashing damage, so all of those sword-wielding melee characters are effectively dealing zero damage to it no matter what. But our archer fighter has a chance to hit of 95%, so it will basically deliver all of its damage in most cases. On a completely opposite end of the spectrum is Roper, with its 20 armor class. Even our archer fighter has less than a coin toss of a chance to hit. If you play D&D long enough, you will eventually fight against all of these monsters. So even if you play one specific character all the time until the end of your life, your theoretical effective DPR will differ wildly from one combat encounter to another, let alone your actual real world damage based on the low sample sizes and statistically insignificant scenarios. I have barely mentioned all of these and other monsters special traits and capabilities that make them even harder or downright impossible to hit or deal any damage to. And we are talking only about challenge rating 5 monsters, which isn't even that high to begin with. The higher you go, the less reliable any theoretical DPR model will be. When we calculate hit chances and damage per round, we never consider magic items and other gear you may pick up during your various adventures and quests. For me personally, magic items are as numerous and common as my tinder matches. Zero in both cases. However, many of you are luckier and actually get to have some extra fun from time to time. This of course cannot be quantified. Gear availability from one table to another differs tremendously. Even just a simple common moon touch sword can often double your damage against hundreds of different monsters who are resistant to non-magic slashing damage or make it higher than zero basically against those who are completely immune to it. Then we get to the damage versus accuracy discussion again. Both are important. Don't get me wrong, but would you rather get a flame tongue which adds 2d6 fire damage to all of your damage rolls, or would you rather get a basic plus 2 sword that increases accuracy by 10% and damage by, well, probably less than 10%. That extra fire damage is basically useless against devils, so plus 2 would be much much better. However, if you are on a mission to exterminate a bunch of rogue plant creatures, flame tongue is most likely a much better choice because most plant creatures are vulnerable to fire damage, so that 2d6 roll is getting doubled on every hit. This kind of brings us into another thought experiment. Would you rather play a character who has 1 hit point and deals 100 damage, or 100 hit points and deals just 1 damage? The correct answer is neither if you ask me, which is why all D&D characters fall somewhere in the middle of this spectrum. Barbarians might have more hit points than wizards, but wizards can just fireball everything into ashes when needed. When building any kind of damage oriented character, be it a 
single target damage specialist or a blaster caster with large area of effect damage spells. All of that damage potential is only as good as you are above zero hit points. Overtuning for damage while ignoring defenses and overall staying power often leads to characters who effectively deal zero damage more often than not because they just cannot handle taking any damage themselves or they fail too many saving throws against debilitating conditions and other negative effects. So even as a damage specialist you are usually forced to find that sweet spot between offense and defense. There is no universal solution, one size doesn't fit all. The differences between campaigns, other players preferences, DMing styles and a bunch of other factors affect the risk reward equation significantly and it is on you to figure what works the best or at least close enough to the best. Another issue that doesn't often get discussed is the speed of damage delivery. What is the maximum amount of average damage you can do in the first few rounds? A character who does 40 damage in the first round, 15 in the second and 5 in the third has the exact same damage per round as another character who does 20 damage during those first 3 rounds. You may often want to do as much damage as quickly as possible because killing an enemy faster means that enemy won't be able to harm you in the second round and all the subsequent ones. Unless of course the DM decides to send a bunch of clerics against you and then keep you know casting revivify on their fallen mates and each other then you're most likely screwed anyway but I digress. The way you deliver damage matters as well. Assuming identical hit chances one attack dealing 30 damage has the exact same DPR as three attacks that deal 10. However in most cases three attacks are better than one. Sure a critical hit on that one big damage is very very juicy but the likelihood of dealing zero damage is also much much higher. When you attack three times you're way more likely to deal at least a little bit of damage. Also what if the enemy has just five hit points and there are two more enemies trying to slaughter you. You definitely want to spread the damage more evenly instead of wasting all of it on a target that will die if you just sneeze on it. Unfortunately, despite all these faults and shortcomings, DPR is still one of the most useful tools we have when gauging the potential combat effectiveness of characters focused on dealing damage. I have never ever built a character for myself or for this channel which didn't satisfy my own arbitrary accuracy and damage requirements. One thing is for sure, over the course of the long campaign with dozens of combat encounters, the numbers will average out. Once you roll that d20, one or two thousand times, the average will be very close to 10.5, no doubt about it. However, it is entirely possible to underperform greatly in a very important deadly boss fight, while it is also possible to roll a bunch of natural 20s during an easy, inconsequential random encounter where godly rolls won't matter anyway. I've seen three natural ones in a row in a super deadly boss fight and I've seen four crits in two turns in an encounter I don't even remember who we fought against. You never know what part of the d20 result range you will get so the only thing you can base your potential damage output on are statistics and averages. If you have a character that is on average 10% more accurate and deals 30% more damage than another character that will be evident over the longer period of time but at the same time it's really not worth spending too much time mulling over the numbers. Good enough is very much a valid approach in most cases because your character truly is more than just a collection of numbers and game mechanics written on a sheet or saved in some digital character creation tool. Of course damage isn't everything. One well-placed, well-timed casting of slow or hypnotic pattern can often accomplish way more than just shooting a barrage of arrows in every fight. But just because you opt not to bother with dealing damage doesn't really mean you can avoid the roll of dice completely. For example, every time I decide to cast the aforementioned slow spell, the targets of that spell just keep passing their wisdom saving throws for whatever reason. When I cast Hypnotic Pattern, even though I run the risk of targets being immune to charms every time, the spell just works for me for whatever reason. Both spells are relying on the exact same mechanic, yet one usually fails me while another one serves me well. I mean, I know this is anecdotal evidence, but it is important to understand that the overwhelming majority of control and other effects that do not deal damage are so-called save or suck. 
they are amazing when they work, but when your opponents start passing all their saving throws, it can often feel even more frustrating than missed attacks or low damage rolls. The randomness of dice rolls is integral to D&D and trying to predetermine anything most likely won't work, that's just how it goes. DPR the hell out of those buttons down below, let me know your thoughts in the comments as well. The script for this video is available for download on my Patreon page under the Fireball tier, it's not mandatory, it's 100% optional, especially since I basically just read it out loud for you in this video, but if you find the Patreon perks worth the trouble, worth your time and worth your money, chuck a few bucks my way over there. Special shout out to all of my current patrons, thank you for your continued support. I'm preparing a bunch of new content, the end of the year will be bombastic. With everything said and done, me and Max Munchkin out, talk to you soon.